Programme Director, and I'm just here to introduce these wonderful people. This is Joseph Aldsara. He founded his own collection, Aldsara, in 2008. <laughs> and the collection is uh, one that I think resonates with modern women. And this is Garance de Ray. The modern woman. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, who founded AtelierDeRay.com, uh, who is a wonderful Parisian that lives in LA and New York, who I've just been having a wonderful conversation with about style. And she's going to be discussing with Joseph the success of style. So enjoy. Thank you. Hi, everyone. And hi, hi everyone. Joseph. Hi. <laughs> Um, so we're going to speak French. No. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph speaks very good French. He was born in France. Yeah, I was. Um, I actually lived there till I was 18, which not a lot of people know. But um, I know I was very surprised the first time you started talking to me in French. And I was like, this is great French. And you were like, I'm French. I, I was <laughs> born in France. I know. My CEO <laughs> says I need to have a, a fake French accent <laughs> so, people, so people can identify me. Can you do it for us? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. We're going to do that the whole time. <laughs> so you were born in France. Where, where was it? So I was born in, uh, in Paris, in the uh, 6th arrondissement. Um, and um, my, the reason I sound like this in English is because my mom is American. Um, so I have this, I sound American, but I'm I'm more French than I am American in a lot of ways. Um, but I grew, up in, I grew up in Paris. I had a pretty standard French upbringing. Um, and I, you know, I went to high school there. Um, I you know, was nerdy and, <laughs> and geeky there. Um, but I, I sort of decided early on in my education that I really wanted to come to the States and, and study. And that's sort of how I made it, how I made it over to, to the US. How, what prompted you to do that? Was there something specific? What influence or? Um, you know, as you know, I think that the, the French education system is, um, is very rigid. Um, mm. And so I think it forces you to choose very early on what you want to do. Yes. And I, I actually didn't know very early on that I wanted to be a designer. And so, you know, I really was, I was sort of craving a space that I could, um, where I could explore all of the different things I was interested in, whether it was art history or sociology or fashion. Um, and so going to, I think going to college here, um, as I'm sure a lot of you feel, um, was really a great way to, I think to, to explore all of those different um, interests and, uh, and finally sort of decide on, on fashion. So what did you study exactly? So I studied mainly art history and art. And for, for a while, I, um, I really thought I was going to work in, in art or art history. Um, and you know, I would have loved to have worked in a museum or in a gallery. And I think that was a really big part of what I was into. Um, and I wrote this paper. I went to a really small liberal arts college called Swarthmore um, College, which is in Pennsylvania, which is a uh, total shell shock coming from Paris. <laughs> um, but we, I had to write a paper. And I wrote the paper about how um, how basically fashion brands were using art historical references to sort of convey messages about um, their brand identities. So like, uh, you know, at the time, Saint Laurent was using um, a lot of sort of Toulouse-Lautrec Toulouse um, iconography, and it was really to convey this idea of like Frenchness, but also of something that was a bit lewd and a bit like sexy in this very um, uh, primal way. Um, and I think I became really interested in fashion through that lens. And that's when I really started to think about fashion more seriously. And it had always been something that I was into. You know, I was into, I was really into clothes and I was into 
fashion magazines um, as a teenager. How but were I, you dressed when you were a teenager? What I was mean, I thing? was, I cannot stress how <laughs> like nerdy I was <laughs> as a, as a teenager. I was really, I mean, I was really, um, I felt, I think I felt very different uh, as a teenager and I felt, um, uh, not very at ease with who I was, uh, and I didn't, you know, I didn't have like that, the, I didn't have like a particularly like happy high school, um, you know, high school experience, um, and so I think I had this feeling that clothes could somehow be a way to change that, like clothes would make me popular, or clothes would like, uh, somehow people would think differently of me if I wore different different clothes. Um, so I think I always had this sense that clothes had this transformative power, which in my case it didn't necessarily do that. Um, <laughs> but but I you know I do still very much feel that way. Um, but no, I wore actually I probably wore more or less what I'm wearing today, and my style hasn't changed that much since high school. So it, was it more something that was making you dream? I think in that sense we're very similar. I felt very isolated and I was reading all the magazines and dreaming and thinking this is never going to be my life, but, you know, or looking at fashion TV. Yeah, things yeah. Like that. <laughs> um, so you get to America and you start studying and your interest in fashion gets more focused what was the shift? When did you decide, okay, I'm just gonna go and be a designer? Well, you know, at the time, uh, I don't think that there was the same awareness that there is now about designers and about how, you know, com fashion brands work and how companies work. It was, um, it was at the at the early onset of the internet, if you can, if you can believe it, um, <laughs> but. Um, I went. I basically went to work for uh, during a summer for a modeling agency, um, and um, I didn't particularly like it. But I, it did give me some insight into how fashion was actually a business. And I think when you're sort of on the outside and you don't know much about the industry, it can feel like this weird, like nebulous world, and you're not exactly sure how it works and um, and I think once I got more of a sense that this is actually a place where business is done and where you can, and there's sort of an ecosystem and there's writers and there's PR and there's retailers and I think that that made me, um, I think that made me really rethink wanting to work in the industry and I think it made me feel, I think much more um, I felt much more passionately about it once I realized that it wasn't as frivolous as I imagined it to be. Is it something, um, were you always that pragmatic? Does it come from, I know your parents were working in banking yeah. and all that. Is it something that you felt was necessary for you to allow yourself to pursue something more creative? Um, the fact that it was grounded into... I think... Um, yeah, I think so. I think that's probably my personality. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think that I, you know, I'm very, the creative side comes very easily. Like I, I'm, you know, I get really excited about like clothes and I get really excited about fashion with the capital F and I think it's like, um, you know, I think that's what drives me every day. But I think, um, I think the fact that, um, I think the fact that it was really, that I, I saw it as an industry, I think was something that was very um, motivating mm -hmm. for me. Did you always draw? I know you- Always. You drew, always, yeah. Yeah, since you were a kid? Since I was a kid, I always drew, pretty much always drew like princesses. <laughs> so there was some fashion component in the drawings. Um, uh, I also was, you know, very obviously gay from very early on. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I think I, drawing was always a really big constant. Right. And, and still is. I mean, I spend 
80% of my time now at my job drawing. Really? Yeah. Oh, we have to talk about that later. Because usually uh, creatives that have such a thriving business are like, uh, my creative time in is now reduced to 5% of what I do, and the rest is making decisions. Yeah, I draw, I mean, I draw, you know, I draw a lot. I draw at home, I draw in the plane. Um, iPad pencil has made a huge difference for <laughs> me. Um, I draw, I mean, I obviously draw um, mostly at the office, but I actually find for sure my, you know, my, my time to create has been reduced compared to what it was before, but I actually find that I'm much more focused now um, because I have these, you know, times that I get to do this, and I think that I'm, you know, I think I'm much more aware of it, and I'm, I, I spend sort of less time, I, I don't waste as much time as maybe I used to. And so you, you start doing your first steps in fashion, I think you also interned with a few designers, or yeah. start working with them? Yeah. Who are they? So I started, um, I started working, or I started interning at Marc Jacobs, and that was, uh, I mean, the, in, the beginning of that was sort of interesting because I, um, I was in college, I hadn't graduated yet, and I sent out my resumes to a lot of different people. Um, and I got a call one day from someone at Marc Jacobs, and they needed someone immediately. I was still in school in Pennsylvania. Um, but I went up to New York, I interviewed, they needed someone right away, I was available, and so they, you know, hired me. So bye um, bye school? Yeah, so I basically mm -hmm. sort of commuted between uh -huh. like my internship and school for about a month and a half um, until I graduated. But I was, um, what I realized later is that they had asked an intern to alphabetize all of the resumes they'd received, and thankfully, my last name is Altuzara, so I was the first one that they called, and I was the first one who was available. Um, so that made it uh, a very fortuitous, um, a very fortuitous experience, uh, and it was a really, you know, it was an awesome, it was an awesome experience for me because I think I had this totally skewed perspective on what I'd be doing or what a uh, fashion company does. Um, Were you doing the coffee or yeah, you know, everything? getting Mark coffee, <laughs> um, you know, doing like little projects on you know stitch work or things that they needed to see, or helping with uh, you know tech packs or cutting tickets. Um, nothing particularly creative, um, but but actually, I think it was a really seminal experience because it really gave me. Uh, I think a lot of insight into how things worked. Um, and it was also, you know, it was great to see, to be able to see him work and to mm -hmm. be, um, you know, to be so close to the creative process, even if I wasn't necessarily a part of it. So how many more experience like this did it take you to say, this is going to be what I'm going to do, yeah. I'm going to be a designer? So after that, I went to uh, work for Jack and Lazaro. Mm -hmm. um, and this was when Proenza was really like seven or eight people. It was very small. Um, it was still in, um, in a space that they, you know, that had been their apartment. So it mm -hmm. was really, a, uh, it was, it was, still a budding company and that was an amazing experience because obviously um, working in a smaller company gave me a lot of insight into the inner workings beyond design of the, the of a company like how does press work and how does sales work and how does the finance department work and I think that was that was an amazing experience and I love you know, Jack and Lazaro, and to this day we remain really good friends. So that was a really, uh, it was a really um, amazing introduction. Um, and then, um, because I hadn't gone to fashion school, I felt this sort of, uh, I felt this sort of like innate, like sort of uh, sense of inferiority 
compared to all other people of my generation who were working, just because I felt like I hadn't gone through like sewing classes or I hadn't gone to, you know, I hadn't done pattern making or, so I, a lot of it I was learning on the job and I think I had this um, sort of chip on my shoulder about it. And so I, I met this, um, this modéliste or pattern maker uh, who was French but who was living in New York and he was doing a lot of patterns for a lot of different companies including Proenza but he was also doing stuff for Jason and for Takoon and for Zach Posen um, and I asked him whether he would take me on as an apprentice um, which is very common in, um, in fashion and so I started apprenticing, I left Proenza and I started apprenticing full time for him. And that was really when, from a technical point of view, I, I sort of feel like that was my, a lot of my technical um, education happened with him. And essentially I was making patterns for other designers and interpreting drawings into three dimensional you know, uh, form. And he was really, he was French, um, and he was really the person who, uh, who ended up encouraging me to go back to Paris, which was not really something that I wanted to do, just because, you know, I much prefer living in New York than living in, in Paris. Um, but we, I, I ended up, you know, deciding to, to leave the U.S. and go back to Paris, and um, started looking for a job, which was a, a deeply humbling experience um, because I hadn't, re you know, I had started working at Mark right after school and um, I went straight to Proenza and I went straight to this apprenticeship, so I, would, I never really had a time when I was out of a job. Um, and for about like, you know, um, four to six months I was in Paris basically just like interviewing constantly. Um, and smoking cigarettes. Yeah, smoking cigarettes and cafes when you still yeah. could smoke. <laughs> um, you know, I was, I was uh, and it, you know, I met a lot of people and I networked a lot. Um, and I ended up meeting, um, I ended up meeting Ricardo. Uh, who was at Givenchy, and he was looking for a designer. And, um, and in hindsight, I feel incredibly lucky to, to have been chosen because, or f that he chose me, because I was, you know, I was relatively young. I had basically very little experience. Um, and I think he just, uh, you know, sort of took a chance on me. Um, and that was, and so I worked, started working with him at Givenchy, which was, uh, which was wonderful and um, you know intense and um, such a steep learning curve. And I feel like in a lot of ways my process and my my um, my thinking was really shaped during that time working with him and working with the team. Um, and I, I feel very, you know, I feel very lucky that I was able to work with him and work in Paris um, and and uh, um, sort of experience that that uh, you know that side of fashion in France because it is it's a very it's a very specific sort of industry there. Yeah, very different from here. We'll yeah, talk very about different. That later. Yes, so. Tell me about the day you were like, okay, this is it. I'm going to to do it on my own. Yeah, um, I don't know that there was a day. I think that I always, you know, I think that there was always a part of me that really wanted to try. Right. Um, and um, and I think. You know, I'd been thinking about it a lot, and I've been thinking about um, what my next move was going to be. And um, at that point, you know, I had started talking about it a little bit with my colleagues at Givenchy, and um, and at that point, I'd also met Corinne um, and uh, Melanie, who is my who is still my stylist to this day. 
Um, and we had talked about it, and Corrine was very encouraging of this. Um, and I think, honestly, from a pragmatic point of view, I also felt like I was, you know, I was relatively young, and if it didn't work, then <laughs> it wasn't really the end of the world. So um, how old were you when you started Alcizara? I was Al 20, I was either 26 or 27. Um, I can't remember actually, um, but I, you know, I sort of felt like, well, if I, I sort of have the energy now, like I should just do it. Now. <laughs> I don't know. It wasn't like a, it wasn't a deeply, um, you know, reflective um, thinking process. I think I, you know, I just really felt like this is the right time to do it, and and I think, you know, I also. I also did feel like I had something to say, and that there was there was a there was a woman out there who I really wanted to speak to, and I think, you know, there was this sense for me um, that, you know, when you're working when you're working in fashion, sometimes, especially, I have to say, especially when you're a man working in fashion and you're drawing women's clothes, I think that there is. Uh, it's very easy to get really wrapped up in the fashion of it and not um, and not keep in mind that your clothes are going to be on someone's body. Um, and I think I was really keenly aware of that when I was working um, when I was working in Paris. And I think um, you know I felt like I wanted to start this company and I wanted to really have a process that was um, very mindful and that was, I think, both very creative and, um, and really pushing a certain vision and pushing silhouette and um, pushing an idea every season, but also that would be, um, I think, very, um, I wanted it to be like a listening process as well, and I think to to be to have the sort of uh, to have the um, the the lack of ego needed to also like go into a store and talk to your customers and talk to um, women who wear your clothes and what they don't like about your clothes, which is always. It's painful to hear, <laughs> but necessary. What are the um, things you learned? Can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, honestly, a big thing I learned, especially when I started designing in America, um, was how um, important bras are. <laughs> <laughs> um, and It's um, so important, though, because it's true. Being a man, yeah. why would you, you know? Yeah, you don't think about it, and I think... Um, I, I, I think it's something that, it's those little things, and there's plenty of them, but um, it's those little things that actually make the difference when a customer is going in a fitting room um, about whether you're going to spend, you know, $1,500 on the dress or not. Um, and I think being, I think being really aware of it and being really open to having those conversations and um, and having someone speak to you really freely about how they feel about their bodies and how they feel about how they feel about themselves when they're wearing your clothes good or bad I think is really important for my creative process um, and that's something which to go sort of go back to starting my own company I think was a uh, revelation and I think it was a really important part of what I wanted when I started the company mm -hmm. um, and there you know there were you know I a, a, a big I mean, and some people can will probably be able to recognize this in my work but I think a big part of what I was sort of into when I started the company was um, women like Kareen you know I think that there was there was this sense that um, you know, 15 years ago, um, being sexy was sort of reserved for a 25-year-old, um, and there was a very specific way that you were sexy, quote unquote. And I think that um, I've always really been interested in um, the idea of seduction and of 
um, and of uh, sensuality and the different forms that that can take. And I think that that was something that I really wanted to explore with the brand. Right. So did you have a specific vision in mind of a certain woman or was it more diffuse? How, how do you think of her? Um, no, it was pretty specific. I think we, you know, I think that I have a very, um, I think one of the biggest parts of the, of the brand identity is really the half French, half American thing, mm -hmm. which I, and I obviously mine my own sort of um, upbringing for that. But I think there is a very sort of um, French side, and by French, I think sometimes it's hard to define, but I think there is this sort of, um, I think embracing of, of the body and of uh, this certain confidence and, um, but in, and sophistication and seduction, but in a very sort of adult way. Mm -hmm. I think that it's a, um, and that's something that I very much want to bring to Altuzara is, a, you know, all of these sort of French women that I grew up with who, um, despite maybe not feeling fantastic about whatever part of their body it is, I think that there is a, a general, um, you know, I think, I think French women feel like it's very seductive to love your body no matter what. Um, and I think that that's something that I always, that's always very important um, to me. Um, and then I think the American part is really, and that's something that I find really interesting too, is a very, American fashion is very pragmatic. Um, and it's a lot about sort of separates and about, um, you know, sportswear and workwear. And I think that it's the melding of the two that I'm really interested in. And some, you know, someone was saying a uh, couple months ago, that they feel like because I was um, because I was brought up in Paris, I sort of fetishize American culture. And we were talking a little bit about this yesterday. Um, and I do think that's a, a big part of it as well. Um, but I think you know I had a very specific I had a specific idea, and in the beginning it was a very specific silhouette. Also, it was a really conscious decision for it to be you know, quite body conscious, for it to be a slit skirt, um, for it to be really about tailoring. Um, and I think that's not something that we've really moved on from. Like, I think it's something that I feel is really in my DNA and I think in the brand DNA. Yeah. So um, you start your brand, um, I think it was 2008? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm in it. I have this like tub, <laughs> tub of iced coffee that I need to drink from right now. Yeah. It's like, can you do an hour without mm -hmm. drinking? No. Yeah, clearly not. Um, and that's, it's about when I started to, I, I opened uh, my blog in 2006. And I have to say, at this moment, um, was a big moment for American fashion, the years after, right after you started. It was sort of a, a whirlwind with a lot of new designers, a great new energy, New York Fashion Week, you know, suddenly like becoming really a center of attention. Um, and you are in there and you suddenly kind of like emerge like one of the most promising talents um, of American fashion. Um, tell me a little bit about these moments because it must have been pretty overwhelming at some moments. Yeah, it really, uh, I mean, it was a really, you know, I, f I feel in retrospect, when you're in it, you really don't realize that it's happening to you. Um, but in retrospect, we were, you know, obviously so lucky and I feel, you know, really blessed that we were embraced that way. Um, you know, when I started the company, um, it was basically like I was on my own. Um, you know, we, I had a lot, you know, people helping me, but basically people who, you know, were working at other jobs. And um, I, you know, I remember, 
I remember op we started with a very small collection. It was like 15 pieces. And we were in my living room. And um, my mom had come over from Europe and was like dressing models in my bedroom <laughs> while, <laughs> while like, you know, the Barney's appointment was there. Um, and I was really, you know, I think, I think some of the things I just did out of ignorance and I, um, and I just got really lucky. Um, you know, I met Anna very, very early on. Anna Wintour? Yeah, sorry, <laughs> Anna Wintour, very early on um, because basically I like, when I had my first collection, I was sending, I sent all of these handwritten notes to editors, basically, you know, telling them about myself and asking them to come to my apartment to see my collection. <laughs> um, and Mark Holgate, um, who's one of my dearest friends, was actually the first person to answer. And he came over um, and he saw the collection. Um, and Mark works at American Vogue. And he, um, he, he, you know, said that they would want to shoot it, that Anna would want to meet me. Um, there's a funny story, actually. I, went to Paris to sell the collection, and I was supposed to meet Anna when I got back from Paris. And um, I was on an Air France flight, and my entire collection of like 15 to 20 pieces was in one suitcase. And it was on a Monday, and I was meeting Anna on Tuesday morning, and Air France lost my luggage. Oh. <laughs> which was obviously awful. I think it even had been with the dresses, you would probably have been pretty stressed <laughs> about. Yeah. The, right? Yeah. I, I was them. obviously in a full panic <laughs> because the luggage had been left on the tarmac in Paris. It's they such couldn't a fashion locate, drama. They couldn't locate the suitcase. Um, I had to, you know, I had to call Anna and cancel my appointment, which was like soul crushing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I ended up, you know, she ended up rescheduling for like 10 days later. They found my luggage. But in that moment, it was like, no. <laughs> um, but there was a lot of stuff like that. And, it, you know, it happens to... How do you deal with these kind of moments? Do you meditate? Like, do you drink? Uh. Uh, <laughs> where do you go? <laughs> I think I was... Probably, I, I don't, I, I really, I think I like totally blacked out when that <laughs> happened. Um, but you know, and, and there were a lot of, from the very beginning I was really lucky to be embraced by a lot of people and Anna was a very early supporter and, and I think, you know, there, what was, what's so great about starting a business in the US, in this community, is that people, really genuinely want to help you. And I, I think, I don't know if you felt that, you felt that way as well, but I think that there is a, um, maybe not, <laughs> Judge, judging by your response. Um, but I think I felt like, you know, there were a lot, this was, and this is really coming from France where there really were no initiatives for young designers. There were, there was really no interest. That's like, why I started, that's why I, I was doing this phase. Um, I started in France and the number of closed doors was crazy. Yeah. And for, I mean, the first years that, and, and my work was really starting to be known and, and everything, but Paris just wouldn't move. And then I moved to New York and everybody was interested and everybody wanted to meet me. Yeah. And then when I went back to France, everybody was like, hey, come yeah. over. So yeah, it's a funny experience. Yeah, it is. It, it's and I, and I think, you know, there's this from the outside. You have this sense that at least the industry here is very tough and very closed, which I'm sure to a certain degree it is. But I think once you sort of are introduced to it, I think you're really welcomed with open arms. Or certainly that's how I felt. Um, and you know, even like m meeting with Anna. Um, you know, showing her the collection. She literally picked up the phone and called Barney's that day to have them come and buy the collection and Dover Street Market. And she was instrumental in a lot of our beginning and growth. Um, and not, you know, not just Anna, a lot of people And that's in something the industry. that um, has always, I've always admired you um, for how you mix 
your life, your friendships, your work. Um, I've you've you've been you know working with Vanessa Trena yeah. and you were talking about Melanie and you are a very good friend with Alexander Wang and there is a real feeling of community and of support um, and I think you know they support you you support them there is um, really something very strong that I admire a lot there can you tell me about how you formed these friendships so early on and how they grew as you all got to yeah. you know get more known and successful? Um, yeah, you know, I think um, it's a really good question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that I, I was, al I always have been very m aware and tried to be very mindful of the fact especially when I was beginning and we were talking about this yesterday, like I was sort of the hot new thing, you know, on the street and you're only really the hot new thing for so long. Um, and so it's really important to have like real friends and to have people who, um, who aren't gonna, you know, drop you when you aren't as cool or as popular. Um, and I think you, you just have to, I think really listen to yourself and listen to your instincts. And I think a lot of the people who, you know, I'm friends with now were people that I started with in the beginning, like Vanessa or Melanie, or, you know, Alex and I, Alex started a little before me, but Alex and I met very early on too. And, you know, we, almost never talk about fashion. And I it's mean, funny, I remember you going to his show and him going to your show, and I think to me that was the cutest, coolest, because your shows were like almost- Back to back. Yes, yeah. exactly. So it, was, it, was, it was just a, a great show of what fashion could be, because you know yeah. how sometimes it's just like get so competitive and all that. Yeah, and I, I think, I don't know if this is a, I don't know if it's a, a generational difference but I, I do like I'm friends with a lot of designers and I actually love being friends with designers because there's very few people you can you can talk to on that level who have a business who go through the same creative challenges that you do who yeah, yes yesterday we were at dinner here and uh, Joseph was sitting next to Sander uh, Sander Lack from Cis Marjan. Marjan. yeah and I think you spend the whole evening talking about yeah you talk about your process and, creativity and, and how and, and I, I love that and I feel no competition with my peers. Um, you know, I, I want people to succeed and I want people to have good businesses and, you know, oftentimes I, I get calls or emails from, from, you know, younger designers or designers of my generation and asking for you know, ha has a question about something or, and I'm always, I think it's always really important to be there and to help and to, um, because I think that's what people did for me too. So let's talk a little bit about Fashion Week, Fashion Week and Fashion Today. Um, so it's about now 10 years, your, your, your brand is about 10 years old, it's crazy. Yeah. And um, still doing really well. As you said, it started you know, with a lot of attention and all that, and I think longevity is really the most important thing, probably, yeah. to prove that you're more than the taste of the moment and yes. all that. And in the meantime, we've changed times. Like, internet came and you know, is now taking over everything, obviously. Um, we all had to adapt to a lot of, of things and change. Fashion Week is a different thing. You have seen now by now all these things. Um, and today we're talking here with Matches.com, and which is probably a very important partner for you. Yeah. Um, how did you embrace all that? How did you change and grow um, while at the same time, you know, keep being creative and keep making beautiful co connections? That's a, that's a good question. <laughs> um, you know, I think for me, for all of us in our company, um, I think a really big part of it is knowing knowing who we are and who we're speaking to, and um, and how how to sort of leverage what's happening at certain points of time to our advantage or not 
you know, not partake in it because it doesn't feel like our brand. Like Sina by now is a great example. I think, you know, it was, uh, you know, a year, year and a half ago, it was sort of like what everyone was doing. It was like, I was getting basically like constant advice about like the fact that I should do C now by now because everyone else is doing it. And I think you have to know at a certain point what your business is and who your customer is and if something is right for you or not. And I think that that's a, that's a really important lesson for anyone, I think really in, everyday life, but also if you sort of own a business. Um, because I, I think there are these sort of moments and, um, and trends that happen. I think the, the, the internet question and the, I think the pace has obviously changed. Um, the, uh, I think the exposure to, I think the broader world has changed. I think to a certain degree, fashion has almost become like entertainment, um, and designers are sort of expected to a certain degree to act like, you know, pu public personalities, um, which, um, which for me definitely was an adjustment, um, and because I'm, I think generally a pretty private person. Um, so I think it's, you know, I think it's, uh, it's, um, it's sort of an ongoing, it's an ongoing process. And, uh, you know, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of questions which I'm sure all of you in the audience also think about and ask yourself about, um, you know, how the internet is changing the luxury industry, how customers are, um, are interacting with brands um, and, how many different ways you can interact with brands and um, how as a luxury brand you stay exclusive but also um, stay in touch with the times. I think those are things that we talk about a lot um, and I think you have to be very mindful of it and I'm very lucky to also have a, you know, obviously a great team um, mm -hmm. and a great CEO who, you know, really help me think about this and guide me through it, so. Because it was funny, um, so when I started, um, a lot of luxury brands didn't want to hear about the internet because it was synonym with something not, like too attainable, too, and then one day, <laughs> it, it, it take them a little bit slowly, they decided that it was important, and then suddenly it was putting clothes on influencers, and maybe sometimes I felt going too much in that way and street style became such a thing and um, I feel like, and that's really a question because I don't know how you went through this, but you've always stayed pretty much on your own um, path without being, you know, sudden change. I've always been invited to your shows. Um, I think you felt interest um, very early on and there was no judgment. Um, and it's it's not the same for brands. Like sometimes they're like, oh, you know, now today obviously, you know, yeah. it's for everyone. But like at, at at some point it was like, oh yeah, we don't do internet for a long time. You've never been like that. Is that something you've had to think through, or is it just very naturally for you? You were going towards your own personal interests. Um, I I think I think you're right. I think I was always going towards what I was interested in. Um, I also think, you know, someone, a friend of mine a few years ago when I started my company said something which I actually really resonates to, with me still today, that she was saying like everything is like a pendulum. So like you, you know, like, I don't know, like um, see now, buy now, for example, like everyone's going to jump on it and the pendulum sort of goes this way and everyone wants to do it, but it always you know, there's always sort of a moment where it comes back the other way. And so I think it's really important for me always to be very, um, I think to be very aware of this. And because I, you know, I never want to feel, I never want people to feel, and I never want, I never want to feel that we're sort of yo-yoing through different strategies. Like we're into the internet, now we're not into <laughs> the internet. We're into dressing, you know, uh, 
you know, influencers now, we're not into dressing influencers. I think you have to know what's right for you, and I think when you do something, you really have to believe in it. And sometimes it means that you're a little bit more cautious. And sometimes it's hard because you're maybe resisting a trend or something like this, and you feel, am I killing my brand right now? Am I yeah. doing something that's really wrong? Where do you find that strength? I, I find it, for me, it's the same. Sometimes I've had to hold very strong to my ideas and what I believe in, but I'm human and I see around and I'm like, oh, maybe I should, I don't know, <laughs> dress like crazy and go to fashion show. You know, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, I de you know, I, I definitely agree. I think it is really hard. Um, I think part of what, part of what has helped a lot um, weirdly is the fact that you know we were going through this and we had you know small budgets and so we had to really make careful decisions about where we wanted to put our money and what we what how we wanted to grow the brand um and so i think you just have when you actually have to like make a decision like that and you're not able to do everything i think it it actually focuses you and it focuses your strategy um, but of course, I mean, half the time I feel like I'm, you know, have definitely like FOMO and that I'm not like, <laughs> you know, I'm not like posting, you know, 30 images in, on Instagram a week or, you know, that I'm not like partaking in social media culture or, but I think you, I think what I will say, I do think um, customers and, you know, uh, fashion insiders and people who follow your brand or who follow you, not just from a social media perspective, but just from a general sort of branding and strategy perspective, they know when something is sincere and that you really are doing it because you love it and when something is like a marketing ploy. Yeah, that's always been the way I've, yeah. I've seen things. Even when it's sometimes hard, I'm like, just keep going, trust your gut. Yeah people feel it and it usually yeah. works. Yeah, I yeah. agree. So let's talk about your nomination for uh, the CFDA. Very exciting. So for <laughs> Women's Wear, uh, how do you say, how, what's the title of the? Uh, Women's Wear Designer of the Year. Yes, so <laughs> Joseph has been nominated. Um, Thank you. What, um, what does it mean for you? What, what how do you feel, and are you stressed? Um, <laughs> oh. um, yeah, I think it, it's, it's a huge honor, and I'm not just saying that because I have to say that. Um, you know, it's, it's very, um, you know, it's very humbling to know that people are voting for you and that they like what you do, um, and I, uh, you know, love and respect all of the other nominees that I'm nominated with. So it's a, you know, it's an amazing thing to be part of. Um, you know, what I, I think it's, I think it's so, um, you know, I think it's such a wonderful night, to be honest, um, for the industry because it's, it really highlights how much of a community we are and how supportive of each other we are. Um, and it's actually one of you know, my favorite things to go to just because I think people are in such a good mood. Um, so I don't get, I don't get, um, no, I don't get that stressed about it. Um, but I, um, but obviously being nominated is, like amazing, so I'm very so happy. So do you do you prepare a little text of? If, I've always wondered how people go about it. Like, do you? Okay, if I, I I'm just not going to do anything to not jinx it. Or um, well, I'm I didn't pre prepare anything the time that I won, and I actually got an <laughs> email the next day from someone who told me, "Oh, if you need, you know, if you need to." to work with someone on like, for next time on like a text, here is like a number, basically telling me my <laughs> speech was awful. Um, but, um, uh, but no, usually I don't really, really prepare anything. Not because I don't want to jinx it, just because I'm a, I don't know, 
fairly bad actor, so I feel like it would come out really rehearsed <laughs> or something. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, you were talking about your, how you feel more private and all that, but earlier I was talking about your relationship with um, you know, your friends who you work with and uh, you got married, I think it was two years ago or yeah. last year? Uh, two years ago. And uh, I was looking at your photos uh, yeah. on Vogue and all that. Is that something that, you know, how do you go about that? Do you think about these things? Do you just do it naturally? Um, you know, I've, I'm going to get married at some point and I, I don't know if, you know, how I want to um, engage with that. Yeah. Um, I, I think a lot of the, those decisions I make, I think they're pretty, I try for them to be sort of sincere and pretty natural decisions. I think with regards to our wedding, um, I felt, I felt, like, so with our wedding, I think we, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have necessarily wanted it to be, um, you know, broadcast necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually the, but I think the fact, and not to get like political, but I think, um, you know, I was, Vogue was interested in covering it, and I think the idea that it would be the, uh, it was the first gay wedding in Vogue, um, and the fact that it would be covered in a magazine and that it was a gay wedding, I think was, a, was something that I was, from a, I think, societal point of view, I thought was really important, and I thought um, was, um, I think was really great for people to see. Um, and I've actually gotten a lot of really sweet messages from, you know, gay teens from around the country <laughs> who were who were like, oh, we're so happy, you know, to see someone, you know, a, a gay couple in vogue, and it makes me feel like I can get married, and that, I mean, it was a very sort of, we got such a wonderful, heartfelt response from it, and is, is that, that was really nice. Is that something that when you were a teenager, you would have loved to see? Is that something you struggle with? Yeah, definitely. With? I mean, I think, you know, being, I, you know, I didn't necessarily have any, I didn't have doubts about my sexuality, so it wasn't like I was, I had a hard time coming out. Like, I was very, I was very comfortable, you know, knowing that I was gay, but I also had no, there really weren't, weren't that many role models, which is why I think to a large extent why I sort of have this like, you know, sort of soft spot for Tom Ford, um, because as a teenager, he really was, um, he really was one of the only examples of sort of successful out um, professional gay men that I, that I knew of. Um, and I think that that was a, I think that was a, an amazing example for me and, a, and, some, and something that I think is really important. Um, and if I can even in some small way, you know, provide that, I think it's, I think it's really great. Um, you know, I, on the sort of the other end of the spectrum, I do, f I, I am very careful about um, my private life. And I think um, to my earlier point about you know, um, you're sort of cool one moment and not cool <laughs> the next. I think it's really important to have things in your life that make you happy, even if you're not nominated for a <laughs> CFDA award, um, and to sort of be grounded in things that aren't gonna fluctuate. And, um, and so I try to be very careful about keeping that quite separate and keep even though our wedding was in vogue, but, um, <laughs> keeping it keeping it quite separate. And but it it didn't feel like this a big you know it felt very intimate. The the, the, the photos were you know I, I felt that thing where you 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 inspire but you're not trying to splash it all over. Yeah. Um, it felt very the people that were there were your friends. It was not yeah. the huge. So I thought it was very thoughtful, very elegant, and at the Cute. same time, definitely a great example for people who need this type of message. Yeah. Um, 
which is something also you did at your last fashion show. You 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 um, offered two seats at your show yeah. in support of Planned Parenthood, I yeah. think. Um, can you tell me just a little word about why this is important for you? Um, I think it's wonderful. Yeah, I think it would, you know, we, um, and this again, I think is really how it's not going off of a larger strategy. It's really more like how we feel, how I feel, how we feel as a company. Um, and, you know, I think it was, you know, we're obviously living in a, in a very um, partisan, very sort of divided um, political climate. And, you know, in whatever way um, we can help and feel like we can do it, um, sincerely and um, and naturally, I think it's really important to do. Um, and and I, you know, I also the one thing that I think is really difficult is I never want to do things. Sometimes, sometimes you can do something and it feels like uh, it can feel like a PR stunt. Yeah. You know, it can feel like um, mm -hmm. like you're doing it because like you want. Like a Pepsi want. ad. Yeah. Did you <laughs> like a Pepsi ad? Like you're trying to sort of like, uh, you know, you're trying to get um, kudos for what you're doing. Um, and I also, you know, I think it's important to 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 do things that feel sincere. Mm -hmm. um, and I also don't necessarily, you know, I I I'm involved in you know, whatever things I'm involved in privately. Right. And, um, and I think, you know, I'm very proud to, to be involved in those things. Um, but I think, you know, I don't necessarily feel like I need to broadcast it to get like a pat on the back right, about you. it. Personally. So um, one last question and then we'll do a few rapid fire questions. Oh. I want to know <laughs> what, is, um, what is your biggest dream going forward? For Alto Zara. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, um, you know, I think I think I'm sort of like living my dream. I mean, I feel I, like it. It I'm feels like, like talking it. Talking to all of you. <laughs> um, you know, I I love what I do, and I um, and I love you know, our partners, and I love the support that I get. And obviously the dream is to be able to um, speak to as many people as possible in um, a variety of different ways. And um, and so, you know, basically just to keep on doing that and growing the, the brand and growing the company is, um, is something that I am just super excited about every morning when I wake up. And you still work with your mother. Yeah, she's every still day. she's still around. Not every day she's in. So she lives in London, uh -huh. um, but we, you know, she very much is like super supportive still. And it's like, it's a really it's a great company. I have a great team, um, great people. Yeah. So now, very important questions. <clears throat> what are three items you always have in your refrigerator? Oh. <laughs> Wow, I feel like that says a lot about you as a person. <laughs> um, well, we have, full disclosure, we have like a mini refrigerator right now, <laughs> so it's not full sized. Um, we, have, um, we have prosciutto, always. So you're um, not a vegetarian? No. Number one. <laughs> um, we have, which I think is a great snack. Um, we have bottled water. Um, uh, and we have, wait, what else do we have? We don't have much. Prosciutto, <laughs> prosciutto and water. Yeah, pr Perfect. pretty much. I'd say that's what we consistently have in the fridge. <laughs> um, what is your favorite swear word? Oh, um, uh, my favorite, probably like merde. <laughs> in French? Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> All right, that's mine. Um, <laughs> Who would you like to be for one day? Um, boy. Who? Mm, I don't know. I'd want to be. I'd want to be something. Someone who's like. 
has a really like relaxing day. Uh, I'm gonna do you, what do you think? I always wanted to know what my dog feels like. What did what did I was that was like my inclination because we really <laughs> treat our dog like literally like a like a human princess. So I'm like maybe, maybe but what's the name of your dog? Bean. Okay, a day like Bean. Yeah. Like, <laughs> do you take her to the park? Or him to the park? Uh, no, she's not a big park person. <laughs> but we bring her to the office. A big park person. My, hus my husband, my husband, or, or I take her to the office. Um, coffee or tea? Coffee. Book you'd take on a desert island? Um. Oh. Boy. <laughs> um. Probably. Vogue. <laughs> Wait, a book or magazine? <laughs> okay. Oh. Um. I don't know, I'd probably take something uplifting. I'd probably take something like the Harry Potter series. Oh, that's a good one. Um, an advice for your 20-year-old self? Um, I think I would say, um, I think I would say, I think I would say to persist. Yeah, because um, I think sometimes, you just get, especially in the beginning, it's so demoralizing. Um, and I think to just have the strength to keep going on mm -hmm. is, is important. And what does a happy life mean to you? Um, I think a happy life, um, oh wow, that's a really loaded question. Um, I think it's, I think it's <laughs> feeling loved mm -hmm. and like loving. I think, I think I, I think that's a happy life for me. Great. Thank you so much, Judith. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>
Um, I mean, I really like, you know, I, I think, um, I think there are a lot that are, that are really talented. I mean, I think, um, I don't know that Monse counts as up and coming anymore, but, you know, I like them. Um, I like, uh, I feel like I'm like blanking on everyone <laughs> I like now. Um, I like Cis Marjan a lot. I think they're, he's really good, very talented. Um, who's in Paris? Um, I know. I feel like I'm like on the spot. I can't remember. I don't. I, you know. I also feel like it's really easy to be like a negative about like a collection or about brands. Um, but I think even sometimes if it's not my taste and it's not like what I would design, I th I love brands that just have like an integrity and have a message and have a voice. Um, and I think actually like right now is a really awesome time because there are so many, Gypsy Sport I think is really great. Like I, it's not my, like I don't design like he does, but I think it's like an awesome, like, an, a, like a great brand. Yes? Um, so the question is what inspires you? Yeah, mo I, mostly, um, I think a lot of times it's movies uh, is like a big one, but um, I don't know. You know, I think a lot of it for me is like meeting people, um, going to, or, you know, meet, having lunch with my team, uh, you know, walking around on the street. Like it's a pretty fluid process um, for me. Actually, I would love that. Um, and it's something that we've discussed and we've been, you know, approached about things, but I think it's just the right project. Okay, we're gonna take maybe one last question. I think we're going to give you a mic, sorry. There you go. Um, okay. So as you're talking about like expanding your business, like does that play a role in your creative like decisions, and like how does that look play into like your creative process? Um, I mean, it definitely does play a role because you're you're designing you're designing more for more people for more territories, um, and people here dress very differently from people in China very differently from people in you know, London. So there is a, you have sort of a multiplicity, I think, of, of uh, end uses and of looks. But I think, you know, I think what drives me always is, um, is really wanting to um, do something that uh, elicits emotion and that you, that women will find desirable. Um, and so from that standpoint, it hasn't really changed much. Like it's still, we still start from the same place. I still, you know, draw the collection. We still are really trying to do something interesting. Um, but I think it's then in the merchandising process when you're building sort of the collection and building around it that you're more mindful of you know what you what you also what you also have to add um, to the collection. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank Joseph. you very much.